Namaste and good evening. I, Shravi Jain, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam, Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we've gathered here for a special lecture on climate change and empowerment of children and youth through education. This discussion is a part of the series, The State of the Environment, Hashtag Planet Talks, organized by IMPRI, Center for Environment, Climate Change, and Sustainable Development. I would now like to introduce our speaker for today, Ms. Donna Goodman. Ms. Donna is the founding director of Earth Child Institute, an international NGO developing innovative solutions to address the rights, needs, and capacities of children in the world of climate change, water and forest policy, and program development. She is currently the Chief Visionary Officer at Donna Productions and author of the book, Eco Masters, A Planet in Peril. Ma'am has also been the author for United Nations Classroom Resource Guide on Water and Program Advisor for Climate Change and Sustainability Education at UNICEF. She has also worked with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change for climate change education, training, and public awareness. While leading the most amazing team of professionals driving change for the world's children and environment at UNICEF, Earth Child Institute, and most recently as the Global Program Director at Swarovski Water School, Ma'am has had the experience of working in more than 60 countries worldwide. Her expertise lies in the field of international development, social impact, climate change, corporate social responsibility, water education, food security, sustainable development, and disaster risk reduction. Thank you for joining us, ma'am. We look forward to your valuable insights on this topic. Our discussing for today is Mr. Manish Thakre, Head of Urban Program and Policy at Save the Children India. He has over 17 years of experience in the areas of urban development planning and organizational development in sectors like child rights, urban and rural development, disaster risk reduction, water supply and sanitation, watershed development and management, livelihood, tourism, social protection, heritage management and public health, besides others. We are honored to have you with us, sir. Our moderator for today is Dr. Simbi Mehta, CEO and Editorial Director at IMPRI. I would now like to invite Dr. Simbi Mehta to proceed with the deliberation. Thank you, ma'am, and over to you. Good evening and a warm welcome to everyone. Thank you, Chavi, for uh, the kind introductions and leading us into the discussion today. Uh, today, uh, climate change discussions are all over and societies, nations and global communities are all investing enormously on adapting and mitigating the implications of this very, very imminent phenomenon. However, the question that arises here is that should, the, should these discussions be top down? bottom-up discussions on combating climate change and climate action has relatively remained isolated and hasn't received much policy support. Where do the children and the youth and the young people figure in all this? It is they who are going to face the brunt and they are going to be in charge and recipients and also the beneficiaries of this phenomenon, if any. Uh, hence, their views need to be incorporated. To talk more about this, the IMPRI Center for Environment, Climate Change and Sustainable Development is pleased to host this distinguished lecture and welcome Ms. Donna Goodman, an expert, a practitioner, and a grassroots level worker on the subject. We welcome you, ma'am. And we have with us another eminent expert on the subject of child rights, and he has been working for a long time now, Mr. Manish Thakre, who would be the discussant. So without any taking any further time, I yield the floor to Ms. Goodman. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Simi. And 
to all of our colleagues at IMPRI and to my colleague also, Mr. Takri. And thank you, so, and everyone who's here, thank you so much for inviting me and for talking about this important, very important topic. Uh, I hope I can do it a little bit of justice. Thank you. Thank okay, you. so do we have the, the, the presentation? Yes. I started, um, as was mentioned, I, I started uh, many years ago in the UN and working for UNICEF on water and sanitation, water environment and sanitation. And that's what led me to climate change. Um, Earth Child Institute was founded in 2002 and is now uh, led by a, a team of youth leaders working with children around the world. And I went to work for UNICEF in 2003 on water, environment, and sanitation. And it became clear very early on, I'd say by 2005, that climate change was really driving a lot of the conflict and a lot of what was going on um, related to children, food scarcity, water scarcity, uh, forced migration, all had um, something to do with climate change. It became noticeable early on. And so that was the path um, that I have been taking. If we could go to the next slide, please. So what I've done here is put together, I, I just started talking a little bit about the timeline, but really, in my opinion, it started um, in 1992 with Agenda 21, and that was also the, the Rio Convention that led to the Fr Framework Connect Convention on Climate Change, Biodiversity, and Desertification. And it always struck me that the Agenda 21 document was very, very clear about the need for education, the need for children and young people to be involved. And in those early days, I like to think that it, it was like an incredible roadmap, but it didn't have a GPS system and it didn't have money to go with it. So it didn't go very far um, for a long time. I, I have a son that was born, my youngest son was born that year and he's now almost 27. And um, here we are still talking about the role of children um, and young people in climate change, which is happening now. So um, I have included this quote from the Human Development Report in 2019. It's put out every year by UNDP on different subjects. But I think it's really important to note that just as the gap in basic living standards is narrowing for millions of people, the necessities to thrive have evolved. A new generation of inequalities is opening up around education and around technology and around climate change. Two seismic shifts that if unchecked could trigger a great new divergence in society of the kind not seen since the industrial revolution. We're hearing that a lot lately, that these, these changes are epic and we know that already. The IPCC is telling us just last month that it's unequivocal, unequivocal that human influence has warmed the atmosphere, ocean and land. And the widespread changes just this morning on, on the news here in the US, there are fires in, in California, there are hurricanes, um, you know, climate change is definitely happening. So back to the timeline, um, as I mentioned, Earth Child Institute was founded in 2002. In 2003, I started with the UN writing the book, Everybody Counts, Every Drop Matters, in which I documented what uh, almost every UN organization was doing as it related to children and water. And that's where the clues started showing me that climate change was the driver in so much of this water scarcity. And um, so by 2006, I was able to convince the senior management in UNICEF that 
there was a place for UNICEF at the table and climate change. And so we put together a brochure and a video on climate change and children in 2007 for the COP in Bali. So that's uh, been a long time that we've been working on this subject uh, with not too much happening. The, the, uh, the other thing that I found out that was really interesting is that um, the Climate Change Convention did not have a youth constituency, a children's or youth constituency. They had women, they have farmers, they have business people, all sorts of constituencies, but there wasn't one that even looked at children and young people as stakeholders. So I, uh, we started working together with colleagues in UNFCCC and got some governments to get behind it. And in 2009, the actual children and youth constituency that is so active and valuable today was, was adopted as part of the UNFCCC. So, um, you know, that is one of, I think, the most important achievements that we've done so far that it's actually in the convention and the governments have signed on to the education bit. And it goes on from there. For instance, um, I, I'm from Connecticut, as I mentioned, Yale, Yale Climate Connections that I worked with at the time, also did a program on parenting in the age of climate change. And then to 2019, um, the UN General Assembly did high level sessions about climate change. And here we are today in 2021 facing the same issue of our policies for um, child sensitive guide for action that UNICEF just put out um, a couple of weeks ago with actual environmental indicators showing the impact of climate change on children. We wrote a paper for the government of Greece in 2011 on climate change and children as a human security challenge. So all of this has been out there in the intellectual world is my way of saying that, you know, governments have somewhat acknowledged this and there have been um, trends and changes and benchmarks. However, there, I like it's pretty much toothless because there's never been any money uh, or governmental action that went along with all of these actions, sustainable funds. If we go to the next slide. So this is what I was mentioning um, that came out a couple of weeks ago. The UNICEF has introduced a children's climate risk index. And they say that globally, approximately 1 billion children, that's a, nearly half of the 2.2 billion people under the age of 18, live in extremely high risk countries. And many, if not most, developing countries have between 40 and 60% children as the population. So it shouldn't be considered as a nice thing to do, but it's something that must be done in order to, uh, so sorry, <laughs> in order to ensure that the planet is sustainable for humankind moving forward. So if we can go to the next slide. So what I have proposed is to look at a simple, um, to use guidance for climate change and education and empowering young people. And I'm doing that in a variety of ways, but it must be, it must happen now and much before now, as we mentioned in 2003. And the reason why, as we all know, and has been mentioned and will be continued to be mentioned, it is necessary for a sustainable future on the earth. And in every preschool, primary school, secondary school around the world. And who? This is really important because at the policy level, which is part of what we're talking about today, really we need national, subnational mandates with money to it, with financial sustainable budgets. 
so that teachers can be trained, so that children can be empowered, teachers can be empowered, and parents not to scare people, which is, well, you know, so much of what's kept us behind is the people that don't believe in climate change and, you know, think that they don't want to scare their children, but it's not about scaring, it's about preparing and being um, ready for what is coming next. I wrote a publication, a manual for UNICEF on climate change and disaster risk reduction for child-friendly schools. In two, it was published in 2011. And looking at how these things can be mainstreamed within the curriculum, within the frameworks that schools use, departments of education use to meet these goals. So we can move to the next slide, please. So what does it mean? Um, I've also just recently uh, finished a paper for the Sachi Sai Baba Institute on human values, uh, on sustainable values-based resources and how to look at the education for climate change through a values-based lens. For instance, you know, how can we throw garbage or pollution to Mother Earth if we all respect our mothers, if we respect ourselves, if we value life itself? So these values integrated in with the financial, professional, more practical, technical things. And, and what, are, what are the things that we're needing to do through that? We wanna focus on specific achievable behavioral change, encourage team building and problem solving because all of us know the problems in our local environment. Climate change is a global issue, but it's local. It very, very local. So even back in the early 2000s, we had kids mapping their schools and their communities and teachers as well. And um, so identifying the challenges with a team and solving problems um, in connection with nature is really important. So I have done uh, with the, for the late Nobel Prize winning, uh, Wangari Matai was a good friend and partner with me in the early days of Earth Child Institute. And we started a project called the power of one child plus one tree equals a sustainable future for all. And at the time, Wangari said to me, we wanted to have children in wealthy countries planting a tree and giving $1. And then the children in less developed countries would plant the trees and send back their notes and they would become pen pals and so forth. And she was very strong in this, that they shouldn't just think that planting a tree is enough. We have to take care of that tree every day and for years actually, in order for it to survive in the gardens. And so to foster that connection with nature and with one another, especially in this time where we're all using technology, we really need to be outside to understand nature and how these things work together. And then engage in action planning in an empowered way, because now as a child, as a teacher, I have noticed the problem. I'm working with my team. I'm developing the plan and I'm empowered to go out with, to take action with the right life skills. And then peer evaluation, as part of the teamwork to challenge their, the behaviors um, and promote a public commitment to taking action. So bringing the communities in. Uh, when I was growing up, the, the big action of children was to get their parents and grandparents to stop smoking. And, and there are many, many um, studies now that show the impact of the children getting their parents and grandparents to stop smoking. So look, taking this family community-based approach and to monitor change and especially to celebrate success. We've had so many backfalls that we really want to celebrate the things that we're doing right. Um, so if we can move along. 
to the next slot. Oh, there we go. So I, I, I like this image of the braid because it all works together. Um, and this is where I, I want to talk about more what I'm doing now with Donna Goodman Productions and the Eco Masters book series because after 20, 30 years of working in schools, training teachers, working with kids in a hundred schools, a thousand children, I feel a sense of urgency and a need to get to many, many more, much more quickly. So I am trying a new track, which is fiction uh, and, and a multimedia approach. So I have been writing action adventure books that I'll just speak a little bit more about called Eco Masters, uh, which involve, they're girl led and they involve kids in New York, the US, uh, in, Malawi in Africa, in Rishikesh in India, in Vientiane in Laos. And these girls, they're all 13 years old. They need to find this ancient training center in the Amazon uh, basin in Brazil uh, to, to get moving on their own training and to addressing this planet in peril. Um, so, imagining, listening, learning, doing, playing, innovating toward empowered leadership. So the resources, uh, books, interactive media, virtual reality, online streaming, and then even more practically, training centers for kids to be in nature on each continent so that it's available for all and teachers and parents so I, I, I talk a lot about edutainment. So looking at education through the entertainment lens, but in the training centers, it's also an edu eco tourism piece because the teachers will come to be trained. If they're gonna teach about solar energy, they should know how to put a solar panel on their home or their school. And so um, these training opportunities, I believe will also move things forward if we can move to the next, and they're all interwoven together. So it's the kids themselves. I have a seven-year-old granddaughter who's taking a ninja warrior class and she climbs walls and does zip lines across trees. And these kids, it's, it's very easy for me now to write these characters as amalgamations of children, girls, boys that I've met in schools, in communities around the world, as, as, as it was mentioned in, in 60 countries. So, and the question that kids have asked me most everywhere all the time is what, the, what are the kids like in India? What are they like in Brazil? What are they like in US? What are they like in China? And you know, what are their environments like? So creating these opportunities for them to see what's actually going on with others, what other kids are um, doing to make things better in their own communities. In Earth Child Institute, we started a project called the Global Action Classroom, which was all about, it still is, all about um, connecting kids with each other so that they could talk about what they're doing. And what has worked well is pairing them together with English speaking countries, or Portuguese speaking countries, Spanish, so forth. So that they're connecting with young people in other parts of the world, but are able to speak in the same language for the most part. So we can um, move forward. So as I mentioned, the my book, this, this is the first book, Eco Masters, A Planet in Peril. And the fir first book is called The Pathfinder because Coral, the uh, protagonist in New York City is uh, the pathfinder. She travels through the magic of water and all of the magic is um, things that are possible within scientific realms. So it's very much magic. Um, I spent many years at the UN teaching uh, peace using rainbow glasses 
and magnets to show that the energies are, you can't always see it, but it doesn't mean that it's not there. The rainbow is always there, even if we only see a white light bulb. Um, and so these girls travel around the world through the magic of water and finding each other and joining forces with Mother Earth. So I've just finished book two, which is called Ice and Fire, Eco Masters, Ice and Fire, the Phoenix. And the protagonist in that book is uh, angry in Rishikesh on the banks of the Ganges. And the, the adventure begins at the top of Mount Everest, whose indigenous name is Chomo Longma. And she begins to teach them about the, the history and the partnerships between humans and the natural world. And just as um, the girls get back to Rishikesh, the gla uh, a glacier uh, in the Himalayan starts to melt and the river is flooding. So they are in these situations where they have to learn about the changes in the climate, in the, uh, in the earth, in the environment, and to take action quickly and build teamwork and know who they are and, and work with one another before it's too late. And so this is really um, what I'm doing now. And um, just to circle back to the policy, I think that the most important things are to mandate, you know, with the COP26 coming up, Earth Child Institute will be uh, working on a side event with um, Earth Day Network, with Rotary International, and several other NGOs. We merged three events together. Um, and the very most important thing that I can mention, that I can speak to, is that I, and I have seen in so many countries, is that millions and millions of dollars of funds for adaptation to climate change go into so many countries. They go into a finance ministry or sometimes the Ministry of Environment, but it's almost never, even to this day, includes the Ministry of Education. And that has to change. And the very first workshop that I did with UNICEF back in 2003 was an Oxford Roundtable on water and sanitation and we brought ministers of education and ministers of water together. And it really made a difference in the water world um, to some degree. And I believe that the same thing is necessary with climate change now more than ever to um, bring the education professionals in with all the funds, all the plans that are happening at national level in almost every country now and say, wait a minute, these kids are half of the population here in our country, we have to work with them. And I am of the belief that these kids are more, you know, they're, they're here for this reason. They're very well prepared as souls to, to take this on, but they still need a little tap on the shoulder to say, you know, this is what's going on, here's, you know, a pathway to start addressing it. You know, here, here's your challenge. Think about it, make a plan. Um, we also need to be across sectors. So it's not even just education and finance or environment, but it look at COVID-19, which also had some environmental implications. So looking at health, I worked in the very early days on children's environmental health with WHO, all of these things are linked together with health. And so to, I, I'm overjoyed that just a couple of weeks ago, UNICEF has come out with these indicators. I've been, we've been calling for these indicators for the better part of 20 years. Um, and to document progress in case studies. I, there have been so many case studies, I've written a few of them, but also, Getting that out, I, I feel so compelled these days to get these positive stories of action and change into the mainstream media 
because that's what people listen to more than anything. And it's the average person that really needs to know now. Um, time has run out for the top down approach in many ways. It's still, we still need the top down approach, but um, the reason why I've switched to Eco Masters into fiction is because I think the bottom up approach is essential at this point and really getting to a critical mass. So um, that's it. I think I, I'll leave it here for now. And I thank you all so much for uh, your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Donna, uh, for your wonderful and uh, brilliant insights. We learned a lot. So uh, I'll now invite uh, Mr. Manish for his uh, discussant role. Sir, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, hope I will do justice because uh, Donna Goodman has taken us through past, uh, I mean, uh, close to uh, 29 years. Uh, <laughs> and, and one of the very important thing, uh, which towards the end, I mean, which, which is to be highlighted is uh, the books, the resources, and the and the art of storytelling. So uh, the Donna talked about in her uh, book that how girls are landed up in uh, in Rishikesh, and then there is a climate situation out there, and it is actually happening in the country. And I think your story is uh, very very related to what is actually uh, happening down in the Uttarakhand and the Himachal Pradesh and the Himalayan region. So uh, another thing which, which comes out and striking in your uh, quote is uh, empowering today for a sustainable future for all. And it reminds me that in 1987 around, Brundtland report talked about that we have to have uh, think about the future generation. And it's been years because I'm part of when I, I may be 10 years old and I was uh, just, uh, you know, thinking about like uh, in last uh, 30 years, things have not been changed. And we are still saying that we have to think about the future generation. So I'm part of that generation where climate crisis has started to, uh, you know, uh, I mean, told by the scientific fraternity that things are going to be very difficult in the future. And um, uh, and in Delhi, around uh, 2000, 2001, we are, we are facing the highest pollution crisis. And it, it, took, it took 10 another years to realize that how pollution is affecting and it is causing the, the climate change situation. So um, what Dona has mentioned very importantly about that, uh, why climate change education to the future, to the children is important. And she reflected the journey starting from 1992 to, uh, to 2021 that why uh, climate education to children is very, very important because if we sensitize them to various approaches which she talked about uh, to, to make them understand the human nature connection and also very importantly that how the policy makers to recognize that for the global challenges, the local solutions are important. And those local solutions, we need to look at the future, which is there in the schools and in the streets playing on the ground. So those are the children that need attention from all fraternity, from all disciplines, from all stakeholders. And very important thing, uh, which Dona has mentioned that how we secure the sustainable uh, future through value-based lens. So that value-based lens is very, very important because it is respecting the mother earth. And the, the term mother earth is very, very important because it is nurturing us and our ancestors for past so many years. It's been millions of years, the mother earth is there and it is responsibility of the, this future generation for we adults that to make sure that this mother earth should be you know, respected and to be preserved for the future generation, as well as we need to give it back, like not in a bad shape, but in a good shape where we inherited it. And another thing she mentioned is about sensitizing children about the nature, because that human nature connection is very, very important. In fact, the infant and the toddlers and the younger children, the way they connect with the nature is something we adults need to learn. We need to recognize that 
uh, that children are, they belong to the grounds, they belong to the parks, they belong to the forest. And that's what I think uh, Donna has tried to uh, explain through her, uh, this thing. And within that, she also mentioned that why community is important, why parenting is important and why teachers and the, you know, the entire ed education curriculum system need to be uh, sensitized about the climate change education, because it is not now, then it will not I mean, be, it will not be useful because then we will only be repenting about that. We would have done it. We would have thought about it, but then the time is gone. So I think uh, she has uh, basically uh, sounded an alarm bell that it's been 30 years. I'm in this business, but still, uh, still the people are not thinking, not taking care of it. So an IPCC report and Mr. Antonio Gutierrez saying that it's a red coat. So I think it's, it's very pretty clear that we should uh, respect, uh, you know, the nature and, and 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 the experts like Donna Goodman, who have wholeheartedly, uh, you know, for past thirty years contributed to this, uh, you know, uh, through various uh, means and resources. For example, she talked about, uh, you know, the multimedia and the books. So I think these are the modern times, and we need to, and we know that our children are adaptable to the technology, even as young as three year child uh, child is you know, swapping on the phone. And so it, it's really important that we should adapt to the newer technology and simultaneously, we should inculcate with our children the habits of uh, how to preserve our environment as small as that, why I am not using the older books. You know, it's, it's that simple. You know, if I am passing from class six to class seven, so if, uh, and then I can exchange that book with the, uh, with the young younger children so you know those are the things which are very very pertinent and coming out clearly from dona's presentation and uh, and lastly it is very very important that education uh, just teaching them will not this thing you have to engage them practically you have to involve them so that is very clearly coming out from dona's presentation and and that needs resources and you know uh, and i i agree with you that dona that uh, there are millions of uh, funds is being uh, dispersed, uh, you know, dispatched for adaptation and mitigation. But the main important thing is how we can educate in a way which is more practical, which will be imbibed by not only the lower middle income or a middle income or a higher income, but by the most marginalized. So the whole idea of leaving no one behind is only possible if we reach with climate education to every nook and corner of the uh, of the city and the country and this planet. So uh, I mean, it's it's a fantastic discussion, and uh, hope I made justice to what you presented. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Simi, and uh, thank you, Donna, for, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Manish sir. So, uh, ma'am, would you like to respond, and then we could take uh, a few questions? Yes. Uh, so thank you for those points, uh, Manish. It, it, it's really my pleasure. And as you mentioned, it, it's really time in 30 years, we all know these things. So empowering these kids to take action in their local communities and to connect with each other through the technology, I think is really very critical at the, this time and also the the urban uh piece that you speak to with uh save the children i think is um my experience isn't as much urban i haven't lived uh in in cities uh very often uh, but again i do have experience in knowing that in disasters in many countries, if not all schools are used as evacuation points. So schools are the places where people go to charge their phones, to wash their hands, to uh, know that their family is still alive. So, um, you know, looking at the urban context in that way also, I worked um, many years ago with uh, colleagues that were behind the uh, child-friendly spaces like the playgrounds and the cities and making sure that they're safe for for our children child-friendly cities 
I don't know too much about it, but it's also uh, really quite important. I think that the empowering of the children in whatever way that we can and getting the adults to support that. The other thing that I did forgot to mention that children everywhere have said to me, if you ask them what is their greatest challenge in getting their projects done, they say it's very hard to get the adults to take me seriously. I, I've heard that in you know dozens of countries from girls and boys that are doing these amazing projects that the adults don't take them seriously. And so even for that reason through the media that we get help ourselves help other adults and policymakers and parents and teachers to um, respect the capacities of, of the children. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Silly, just. Uh, yes, just, yes, please. I think, Donna, you rightly mentioned that uh, the values are very, very important because if you really wanted to respect children, it means that comes out from the value because they are the equal citizens of this earth and they have all the right, even as old as, I mean, even if he or she is an infant or a toddler, we, we should entertain them, we should listen to them, we should hear it out. And if they are, you know, uh, growing up, adolescents or youth, then it's all the more important that we should hear them out because they have fantastic ideas. And I, 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 I completely believe that Greta Thunberg and a lot of such climate change activists, children, they have sensitized the entire world, which 11,000 scientists, uh, I mean, they may not have communicated the way these climate uh, child climate activities has activist has you know sensitized the world so we have the knowledge but the medium is the children so i think uh, you rightly pointed out that we need to really uh, hear out the children because their voices are important and in save the children in our theory of change one of the aspect is voice is to hear the children is to make party in a lot of discussion yeah. We, we capacitate them to and encourage them to have discussion with the duty bearers, to bring their voices, whether they are living in slums or informal settlements, to bring their voices to the policymakers. So that is how it is. So thank you very much for, for pointing this out. Thank you. Thank you, Shrivan. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, because um, just to continue with the discussion, um, actually, the rights of every child is being undermined because of um, the environmental degradation that is happening. And, uh, you know, especially Manish, sir, you would uh, second me on this because the, the, those children who are belonging to the most vulnerable sections of the society, they are actually more vulnerable to uh, such changes. And, uh, you, you know, not not just from the vulnerable sections, but uh, those in the well of families, they are also being um, affected early on in their uh, in their lifetime um, with with very dangerous diseases like um, asthma. We have seen cases like five year olds becoming asthmatic. So this is like this should be definitely an alarm alarm bell. And uh, I would like to know, uh, ma'am, your views on how would, uh, should we have uh, climate change education and uh, sensitizing, sensitize uh, the students early on uh, in their um, education um, about, about uh, what climate change is, what it was early uh, before, uh, before they were even born and uh, how things are going to evolve in the future. And, uh, but but we'll have to have uh, curriculum changes, uh, you know. And uh, as it is, uh, especially in India, there is a lot of focus on rote learning. Although the new education policy seems to uh, want be wanting to avoid uh, avoid such a system, but uh, there's a lot of pressure from the parents, from the societies about taking up a good job after doing, um, you know, uh, after excelling in your studies. So uh, how can this change be inculcated and should national and international level organizations, not the governments, um, come in and take this, uh, take a lead, for example, maybe you know, certificate courses, which, uh, would be, uh, which, which would be good if uh, they are able to complete the course on time. And it should be free because we have to have equity 
so should we how can how can the role uh, how can the international organizations of course unicef is definitely taking a lead on this but uh, what about others and then there is the resource crunch from the organizations who are generally ge genuinely interested in uh, bringing such uh, discussions to the forefront how can we do that ma'am over to you oh thank you. what great questions uh, those are the questions <laughs> the questions of this lifetime, I think. <laughs> um, I think that there is definitely a role for civil society and for NGOs, international organizations, as well as the private sector in education. Um, at one point in, uh, so uh, Earth Child Institute, we had a contract with Cartoon Network in Latin America, and we did public service announcements. This was the first time I got the bug, you know, that the mainstream media, because we did messages, you know, you see, we all see public service announcements <coughs> time to time on our radios and television, but, um, you know, making them into green learning. I believe that the way most of our systems are in most countries, the education system, the schools are still run by governments, whether it's local governments. You know, for instance, here in Florida, most of the schools are, uh, are run in county based, not, not, there are federal standards and there are state standards, but the counties, for instance, are deciding if they're wearing masks for COVID. So, if there was a way to um, empower the counties to uh, set aside some funds for teacher training, I think part of it is also, I've seen uh, in my role, I've moderate for the North American Association of Environmental Educators. A lot of teachers are still afraid to teach about climate change. They don't feel like they understand it that much themselves. So, the, so engaging parents and teachers to understand and get motivated to work with their kids is also important. So hopefully that, and, and, and the private sector, you know, when I was with Swarovski, we developed teaching and learning materials that are, that are available free online. Of course that's water, but it also touches on climate change. But, and I just finished developing some things for Verizon uh, also on water education and tree planting. So there are ways of bringing all these actors together in positive ways, I believe. It's not easy. <laughs> sure. If it was easy, we'd all, we wouldn't even have to talk about it. <laughs> right, great. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I'll take two questions from, uh, from the audience. Um, from uh, she, he or she says that uh, a high school biology teacher of mine used to say, you can't study biology until you are in awe of it. How important is it to inspire that awe for the world and the environment in children to empower them and inspire them to work towards sustainability? Well, I think that's like the most amazing question because being in awe of it is everything. I think that's the values-based approach because like, where does it all come from? Every time I'm out for a walk and you see, you know, the veins going through a leaf or the way the tree grows. I mean, uh, I was, I'll give a quick story of a school that I visited in Kenya a long time ago in West Pakot in the north of Kenya. And the students were so proud. They came and showed me their garden and they had one tree per child and they had solar water. And then they came, they didn't have books, they had what they call talking walls. So it was a big mural on the wall and they had a pointer and they were showing me the life cycle of the plant. And this happens and that happens in the photosynthesis. And I said, well, that's so interesting. What does that have to do with what's happening in your garden? Nobody knew. Like the, the practical and the awe and what the rote learning, as you said, must come together, which is why I'm really uh, very strong on the values-based approach now. The same in English, 
the letters that spell earth also spell heart. So uh, not every language, but uh, I'd like to say that. Yeah. Good question. Sure. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question uh, to you, uh, ma'am, is about, uh, you know, uh, as the as the children would grow their um, talent and their capacities and all their cognitive abilities it would all develop and even their skills so they would have uh, enough or perhaps more than enough innovative solutions if they are um, educated early on um, about uh, the implications of climate change and uh, as you said that they always need a pat on their back because um, otherwise, you know, that motivation uh, really makes a lot of difference. Um, their solutions, in fact, that they come out with, uh, it can be very novel. But uh, do you think that uh, policy is ready for it? Basically, how can we mobilize political action? And uh, Closely connected to that question is a question from the audience, uh, from Nitya Sharma, who asks that, how can we combat the cynicism that, com that comes along with the evident indifference from the corporates, from the governments, to take significant steps towards addressing this crisis? How can individuals, especially the youth, the children, make any significant impact without any support or proactiveness from these players or even influ who are really influential in their uh, domain of work. Ma'am. Well, <laughs> I'll leave some of it to Manish, but I, I, I do believe that um, adolescence is, is a really important time to keep that awe of the environment going. That's why the characters in my books are 13. Um, and I wrote a, paper once for UNDP about adolescent girls on the tipping point of sustainable development. We find that, you know, primary school, younger children are still in touch with their creativity and their awe of nature many times. But as they grow older and the rote learning and um, more serious, you know, I don't believe it is serious, but what is considered in society as more serious things come up, they tend sometimes forget or it gets tucked away and then it comes back in youth um, sometimes. But I think that really treasuring the uh, awe of the environment through adolescence can do a huge um, job. And do I think uh, that the ministries of environment that mainstreaming climate change education is possible. I do think it's, I've been thinking it was possible <laughs> for a really long time, for at least 20 years. I, I now think that I, I've always been a connector of, of people and of sectors of sorts. And I think that bringing together the educational professionals with the environmental, with some values-based, I did want to, something with the faith-based uh, leaders on water that, you know, blew it all up. Every, you know, and in terms of water and trees and climate change, every faith, you know, whether it's Hindu or Buddhist or Christian or Jewish or Muslim, and, you know, anything, they all have reverence for nature. They all have reverence and ablution and, and all of these things. And so even getting into religious classes can, can help to um, maintain these things. So I hope that- Yeah, answers. that's very interesting. Uh, Manish, sir, would you like to come in and share your views on this? Yeah, and on both the questions, so very, I, I want to share my personal story. I, when I was studying in my master's, uh, maybe I was around 21, 22. So I have a very good professor, uh, Shiva Swami sir. And we have a climate uh, meteorological observatory in our, in our near our JNU library. And uh, we have been, and there is a syllabus that we have to go and uh, take down the maximum minimum temperature from the Stevenson screen. And if there is a rain, we have to measure it that what is the rainfall. 
and then we have to do the forecasting for the next day so and that's and it gives me a goosebump because if it would have not been sensitized by my teacher that why you have to take up this climatology course and there is a practical work and you have to go down every day and i want at the end of the month that you have to do the weather forecasting so that is something which is like uh, i mean very very important uh, uh, to make the children uh, understand that uh, you know uh, you, you can measure uh, you know your uh, your uh, environment around you not only the pollution because now pollution gadgets are there uh, the infall gadgets are there every i mean the uh, stevenson screen is available so all those things are very very important to give a practical class and i give you an example from save the children philippines we have a project where uh, you know, uh, it was part of the disaster reduction because Philippines is prone to uh, cyclones uh, and there is uh, and also earthquakes. So, but uh, primarily, uh, there was one of the exercises where children were, uh, you know, demonstrated about various meteorological uh, instruments. Uh, for example, uh, how to uh, how to use rain gauge and how to measure uh, rainfall from the rain gauge. So that is one thing. Second thing, very very important is that uh, to have you know. Uh, you know the practical lectures. Uh, it's not about uh, it's it's uh, one is about the uh, you know um, understanding the climate. Another is the disaster risk reduction drills because that is what we do in various of in various of our programs because we don't know when uh, when there will be a you know sudden downpour because now intensity has increased. It is not like a you know a monsoon season for a July till October, but it's sudden downpour and then there is a dry spell for a, a 10 to 20 days. So in that situation, we need to prepare our children that how to respond during the disaster. So we work with children on preparing the evacuation plan or you know, school disaster management plan, which are the exits and what they need to do when there is a floods. And then if they are you know, like completely, the first floor is completely uh, you know, filled with water. So those are the practical exercises we need to do. And third thing is children, uh, what we do in our uh, project is we also ask them to communicate with their elected representative and the government officials. So how, what is the medium? So I think Donna has rightly mentioned that uh, you can write letter, you can speak to them, you can organize meeting and children can raise their voices because that is how, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, Greta started with that. She was the lone child sitting outside the Swedish parliament uh, with that placard, you know? So, I mean, uh, so th these are the things which are very, very important. And I think, uh, I mean, uh, more the children will come, more, more, more they will be united and, and, uh, and the naysayers like, okay, they are because of doing, because of X, Y, Z reason, they may be sponsored by somebody else and like that, but children don't deter. And their agency because of these uh, nay forces is actually growing stronger and that is giving goosebumps to a lot of policymakers across the globe. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, since we are talking about, uh, you know, role of um, young children, uh, we should really listen to what our young participants have to say. I would like to invite uh, Ms. Chavi. Uh, she is a researcher at IMPRI to ask her question directly to our panelists. Chavi, over to you. Uh, Chavi, can you hear me? You are on mute. Your system is hanging. Oh. Okay, so uh, you can please rectify it. No, no problem. Uh, we... Yes, are you speaking, Chavi? Um, hello, am I oh. audible? Yes, 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 you are audible. Uh, please unmute, Chavi. Um, hello, am I audible now? Yes, now, yes. Yeah, sorry, my Zoom stuck. Uh, good evening, ma'am. So my question is like at an undergrad level and being a college student myself, I have seen that not many people around are interested to take up climate education courses. Even in our undergrad, we have a paper, we have an optional paper called Environmental Economics. But then uh, when I see the impact on the ground, I feel that not many people are encouraged to work in this particular area. 
even though there are societies and uh, there are uh, like these fellowships coming which encourage um, young people like us to do more uh, take more action on climate change but then uh, what do you suggest how can uh, people our age at undergrad level basically be encouraged to take up more such courses and uh, educate ourselves about these issues thank you thank you, thank you so yes. much yes ma'am over to you that's that's great chavi thank you so much i first of all i think the environmental economics is hugely important we wrote a paper a few years ago about the value of the the trees and the to the schools and if you know if there are 2.2 billion children planting a couple of trees each uh over a certain amount of time um we had an environmental economist working on that at the time it's really uh interesting you can show financial gain um so i would i would take that course is my my way of saying um and the other thing that i would encourage um you chavi and others in at university level is to get involved with younger children in your community um or if there's a preschool at the university or if there are you know an elementary school nearby and go there and talk to them about climate change and and water and you know making sure that the water is fresh for drinking or planting trees um and and talk about how that can help things like that I, um you know i um i'm sure there's so much more to say about vocational um jobs in the environmental sector but i i'm not really the one to speak to that um have it done too much in, in green jobs but maybe yes maybe someone else can um uh, manish sir would you like to add yeah i just want to add like um, i mean uh, there should not be a horse race that entire world is going for mbas or iits or engineering rather than uh, we should allow our children to choose you know the fields which are uh, you know very different like you know we need to tell the children that who 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 study atmospheric sciences they are called meteorologists who do uh, study on you know environment they are all environmentalist then there is two ways to it one is environmental engineer and environmental scientist and environmental economics and then there is a huge scope for journalism when you start taking up you know climate change education because it, it i mean it it, it, uh, it it doesn't need to be a scientist when uh, you have to uh, talk and write about how it is affecting uh, the social and the culture and the society and the you know and the history so i mean it's all about encouraging and that awe is very very important which i think is raised in one of the question so we need to really inculcate that awe among the children and that should happen at the you know maybe upper primary school level when children started thinking about like which stream i have to choose i have to go into humanities or science or you know uh, commerce and in all the three i think climate is important because when we talk about uh, you know green jobs which ma'am was talking about or when we want them to be uh, green entrepreneurs or when we you know there are opportunities it's not like that you know climate uh, if you study climate science and it will get you a job so it's 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 not it should not be like that it should be like that okay what is my interest and uh, which are the in institutions which are and and that and for that we need you know guidance at the you know uh, at the upper primary school level and the secondary school level so that you know the children can you know see that what will be their transition once they do their graduation and the post graduation and so on so forth so that's that's from my yeah great thank you sir so i would uh, now move to the end of uh, our program towards uh, towards the way forward so uh, way forward in the sense i would be uh, requesting first uh, mr manish to share his views on or or even policy recommendations you know uh, as to how are we really going to empower the youth empower the children uh, and uh, what are your bullet recommendations as to you know it may be in the me short term medium term or even in the long term uh, going ahead and uh, also if um, you could uh, you could think about whether um, 
whether it would be an exaggeration to say that through climate change education and participation of more and more young children it could lead to to a more peaceful world order as the future belongs to them they would be more appreciative of the challenges that are faced that are that the mankind that the human kind is facing so if you could share your views on on these and also of course your policy recommendations yeah i mean i think uh, i i am i'm of a firm believer that if we start engaging with the children now uh, the present group uh, then definitely they will be more sensitized more oriented towards uh, when they in their uh, you know adolescent and young life and they will be and and we are seeing those example through various climate uh, uh, child activists that how how uh, how vocal they are when they when, when they talk to the policy makers when they talk to the officials that that it, the, it's a time to take action now and uh, they, we will not spare you so that is how the language is and 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 we should respect that language because there is nothing harm in it because they have to they have to live in that world because we will not be there to see uh, what type of challenges they will be facing so it is it is high time for we adults uh, as a parents as a teachers as a policy makers that we should want that our future generation to be safe and they should not uh, face the challenges which we are facing right now i mean because uh, covid 19 is uh, is declared by a lot of scientists that it is a human human inter it's, it's it's human cause basically so we we are all we are all uh, you know challenged by this thing and my recommendation for the policy makers is like uh, we need to do a very important thing uh the data for the children because we at the local level because we not uh, many a times we found the data that uh, how many children are there how many adolescents are there uh, how many girls and boys are there and then what are the challenges they face due to the climate crisis how many have been affected by the floods how many have been affected by the chikungunya or dengue or how many have been affected by uh, the heat stroke so these are very very important thing i know it's very difficult uh, for the policy makers to get this data but this data is important and uh, once we have these data then we can uh, you know uh, uh, you know raise advocacy issues with the policy makers that these are the challenges uh, and another thing is to have education curricula uh, which is uh which is you know it's already there but we need to have more practical approaches to that uh, for example in save the children uh, i work with urban uh, urban domain so what we are doing and we are uh, trying to engage with some experts to educate children on urban planning because in our indian curriculum we only talk about histories where we have harappa and uh, you know some civilizations we have urban planning and drainage system and so on and so forth and uh, some good architecture in history books but we didn't talk really about you know urban planning in in, in till plus 2 and suddenly the children uh, you know the students land up in architecture course and urban planning course so it is very very important that we should start early about the current challenges we know that uh, failure of urban planning climate change and cyber crime and the migration because of many other things these are the things which need we we need to in, uh, you know start inculcating or you know uh, disseminating with the children so that's how i think uh, the two important thing uh, to go about it yeah thank you thank you very much sir those were very 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 insightful so uh, i come to uh, donna ma'am over to you ma'am yes i i completely agree with what manish has said and have even worked with many schools where the children are participating in the data collection uh for instance in tajikistan the, there were children um looking at who you know someone is absent for a certain number of days you know were they ill and if they were ill what from and um they were testing the water at the school and knocking on doors at local homes and showing them um you know a very simple h2s test if there is bacteria in the water it turns black the the test and they would go door to door and show the families that, that this is the case and explain to them that they need to filter or test the water so children can and and it can become quite fun for them to participate and collect some of that data if the adults are open to receiving it and and compiling it 
And also to Manish's point about disaster risk reduction, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, sort of creative ways, such as he said, with the evacuation planning and mapping the schools. Um, but I've even seen um, countries where they're teaching young children to swim in drought prone countries wh where, um, you know, a couple of swimming lessons has saved lives of young children when the floods come in quickly. So there are also skills for adaptation at local food gardens, healthy food gardens, as we won't be able to fly food around the world forever. Um, things like that, I think it can help. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Donna, ma'am, and Manish, sir. It was uh, very, very enriching, actually. And um, in fact, uh, I feel, you know, before really proposing the vote of thanks, I feel that uh, this discussion needs to continue. And uh, um, because both of you have spoken from your heart and you know you've been working um, at the grassroots level and you have been working um, uh, to empower young children in, in different uh, fields. Um, so while we know that uh, this issue is not very glamorous, you know, it really <laughs> doesn't bring a lot of policy attention, but it remains at the core, it remains at the center of uh, survival, and it is imperative for families, for, uh, you know, peers, for um, uh, even, even the societies, governments, and also the interna at international level, in fact, a lot of collaboration is required. Uh, for uh, this uh, this kind of empowerment to the children but i think there should be a caveat that uh, they are the young children because uh, their their minds and their mental faculties are very uh, you know it is not uh, uh, before it becomes really concretized and molded uh, they should not be uh, appropriated by politics because um, so much of uh, different sides of the story comes into being. So um, the great work that Greta and her friends and everywhere al around the world they are doing, there is always an opposition. So um, how is politics appropriating or misappropriating this kind of entire generation, force of generation? Um, you know, how can we save uh, or how can we come to the rescue? Where is the where is the where are the fault lines and how we should continue to um, continue to uh, learn from our mistakes i think uh, that should also be uh, considered do you do you really think about it and uh, what would you like to say about it now i think about that all the time and i think that it's so amazing that there are children like Greta and activists um, in each country and, and around the world, but there are billions, millions more that are not activists, that are creative, also brilliant children that are not like having the microphone and yeah. In, in a political stage, as you say. And they're the ones, frankly, that I think it's so important to reach. They're the ones that will survive and thrive it, it, with these kinds of skills um, and understanding. And, I, and that's why I have switched actually to, to multimedia because it's especially, it, and Manish would probably say this also, but especially in my work with the UNICEF and with Earth Child Institute and Swarovski, bringing kids to a big international event and hearing their voices is so important and it, it gets into the minds of policymakers, but they are not even like 1% of the children on earth who all have all of these amazing gifts, who all have schools that can have gardens, who all have, you know, deforested areas that there are sources of the water in the Amazon. We worked um, with the kids to find the eyes 
of, of the places where the water would bubble up um, underneath the ground. You know, there are things that every day, I don't, no one's ordinary, you know, I don't, I don't like to use words typical or normal or ordinary because we're all different, we're all unique, but we're not all public speakers and we're not all being featured on the nightly news every day. And, and those are the local heroes that can make the difference globally. And I think having those kids talking to each other and learning from each other and learning, you know, with their families, with their teachers at schools can, can and will change the world. Yeah, that, that optimism is really required. Thank you for sharing those uh, thoughts, ma'am. Uh, Manish, oh, okay. sir, would you, would you uh, like to add anything? I mean, I uh, echo with uh, Donna. This is it's very important that uh, uh, that not everyone is a good communicator, and there are I mean a huge number of children with different aspirations, different uh, dreams, and uh, they have uh, they they know what they want, and they they know uh, because we cannot push anybody to become a X Z or follow X Y Z. But it is uh, it is very important that uh, that edu that education is very important that they know they are aware they are oriented uh, they know what is important uh, for in, within their neighborhood in terms of preserving their environment and then the thinking from local to the uh, city level to the state and the country and to the global level that is what is important and whether it's a children who is being in the highlight or not that's not important because that's we, uh, we, we it's it's immaterial because they, uh, because everyone choose different fields and different fields as different uh, attraction uh, maybe a scientist who is working on a climate change and preparing this ipcc report that temperature is going to be he may not be highlighted in the media but uh, any uh, james bond movie may be uh, maybe getting a coverage so that's that's, that's that's uh, irrelevant. But what is important is that the, this we own this planet. We have uh, you know duty towards our Mother Earth, and we all want that our children should take uh, uh, um, you know should not commit those mistakes. What we we have done and what we are doing right now. I mean, knowing all these things. So uh, so uh, what is important is uh, you know that every individual is individual. That's how I wanted to put it. Yes, certainly. We have to respect the individuality and uh, and then transfer or inculcate rather the sense of optimism that uh, Ms. Donna shares. Thank you so much to uh, both of you. And um, we have um, come to the end of the program. It, it was so interactive and um, I just loved hearing what you had to say. So I would like to propose the formal vote of thanks now. Um, on behalf of uh, the Center for Environment, Climate Change and Sustainable Development at IMPRI. Uh, we are so happy and so delighted that we could have uh, Ms. Donna Goodman to deliver this distinguished lecture, very, very pertinent on uh, climate change and empowerment of children and youth through, through education. And um, to also have uh, Mr. Manish Thakre as the discussant of the program. Um, of the uh, of the very important theme, uh, which is affecting all of us uh, in one way or the other. So I am so grateful to both of you, ma'am. Thank you, especially you uh, spared your time from your schedule and early this morning, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, for uh, for being with us. Your both of your works are really inspiring, and we hope that we can continue this discussion uh, further. Thank you so much, and I wish you. A very good evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Yeah.